Hi, all, and welcome to Monday Night's All Meta Mode podcast with myself, Digger DeGaz, and we have Gypsy on the line, and we have very special guest, Dave Canterbury. Before we get started with tonight's show, just a reminder, the August issue of Dirt Digest Magazine is available at dirtdigestmagazine.com. Go there and click on Current Issue, and you can either download and the August issue, or you can read it live. And while you're there, you can catch up on older issues. I know there's been some great stories, awesome articles, lots of good reviews, and some absolutely stellar finds. Keep in mind, September's issue is going to be dropping here soon. Uh, sadly, we're almost at the end of August. Oh, I can't believe it. Um, but yeah, so um, sep- uh, September's issue will drop September 1st. So keep an eye out for that. But again, if you want to check out August issue, go to dirtdigestmagazine.com and click on current issue. Hey, Gypsy, how are you doing? I'm doing wonderful. Um, how about you? Yeah, I'm doing all right. Doing all right. Have you gotten out here? Gotten out here lately? Um, yeah, actually, I've been uh, hitting the rivers. Um, sorry, I'm trying to type and, and and talk at the same time. I, I guess I can't do two things at once. But, uh, yeah, I've been uh, um, hitting the rivers because it's just too hot to, to do the land hunting right now. So, um, um that's what I've been doing, trying to stay cool in the rivers and and uh, do some water hunting. Um, my buddy and my buddy Scott and I have, have been getting out. Um, he lives closer to the Guadalupe River than I do. And uh, as we've talked about before on here is people float that river and it's just a beautiful river. It's gorgeous. Um, um, just gorgeous trees along there the water's clear uh it does get murky when there's a lot of tubers in there and uh they've stirred it up but once it settles it's just gorgeous it, it's just a beautiful river but uh yeah uh, i just uploaded my uh a brand new river video today and um got some gold and mm-hmm. some silver and uh, so uh, y'all be sure and check that out. And um, um, just just uploaded today. So yeah, that's all I've been doing. Some water hunting. Very cool. How about you? You've been doing some uh, going back to your uh, areas where you do some surface mine. Yeah, I did. I went back to the buckle site, and you know. <laughs> There's no order to it at all. Like, I'm not any closer to any answers on why so many buckles would be in the same hole together. So when I start figuring that out and can piece it together, I will definitely give an update on it. Um, But I did do some a little bit of dig in there, and I've done some eye spy here and there. Found some early 1930s uh, milk bottles. Uh, 1905 um, Portsmouth Brewer, uh, which is pretty cool. It's it's a like a emerald green um, that I didn't have, so I'm pretty excited about that. And then it's just been uh, you know beads and marbles. I know I found a really pretty bead yesterday. Um, trying a new place out, and I know to put the you know the stopper in the sink down whenever I clean anything. And I usually put oh, actually a yeah. face cloth. Yep, didn't get pictures of it when I found it, and the sink ate it. So that was basically oh. summed up my. I was pretty bummed. Um, <laughs> you didn't then, take the pipes apart. And- <laughs> no, no. Just too much trouble. <laughs> I said goodbye to it. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, it must not have been meant to be because I forgot to grab a picture of it when I found it. So, and then, uh, you know, went back to a site that, that I've, I've dug and I play I spy and I river walk and a bunch of other stuff. And I went there and wasn't really paying attention, found some pretty cool stuff. And, you know, my, my timer went off. I, I did, I only had a little bit of time to spend, um, before I had to get back to work and I, I turned around and I realized there was all these holes and I'm like, what, 
what are those holes? And then I looked over Uh and there's trash next to the holes. So I'm like, oh no. So I started, Uh yeah, in a, in a site that is not, you, it, where I know so many people and, you know, I've talked about bringing my machine down, but just haven't yet. So I'm like, oh, please please so I, I filled all the holes and then I go to go to walk up and I see this big pile you know a bunch of stuff on the on the rocks and I'm like they left like oh, some really cool stuff so I took it and the rest of it trash and stuff I took I'm like yep you're gonna ruin the spot for me whoever you are so uh, just a friendly <laughs> reminder I know that we're all like responsible you know treasure hunters but take your trash with you fill your holes you're going to ruin it for the rest of us it's just i can't say it enough can't say it enough oh yeah that's just so frustrating oh yeah i did get out for just a short short while i think i told you the other day when i was talking to you on the phone or this sometime this week um because we had finally got a rain so i decided to get out for a really short hunt, and when I got out there, I saw some holes. <laughs> I covered them up. I could tell they were nice, fresh. Uh, you know, and I know people hunt this spot all the time, but it's been hunted for years and years, but, oh, there's nothing more aggravating than finding other diggers' holes that they didn't bother to to cover and especially, you know, like you said, when they leave the trash right beside the hole, that's even more frustrating. It is. And I mean, if you so. could be in a trashy area and, you know, I get it. There's trash on the ground. It's, you know, it's a well-used site that's old and maybe you don't think a big deal about it because it's just more trash. But you can tell, like, there's a hole, <laughs> then there's items and, you know, it's just... I yeah, guess, I yeah. Just... <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll have to tell you another, tell y'all another story later. But um, that that maybe we'll just save that for another day, or or maybe later on during the uh, the podcast. But uh, uh, about when I used to detect the beach. But uh, we'll save that for later. <laughs> Let's go ahead and and bring in our uh, special guest tonight. Uh, those of you that joined uh, Mike and I not too long ago, we had uh, Dave Canterbury on, and he has agreed to be with us again tonight. So welcome, Dave. Welcome to um, the podcast. Thank you. I appreciate that. We appreciate you being here. So those of you that don't know Dave, um, we will uh, give him a, a moment to kind of introduce himself, but a lot of you already do know him through the hit TV show um, Dual Survival. Dual Survival. I can't even talk. <laughs> and um, but he also uh, does um, uh, more than that now. Uh, Dave, go ahead and uh, tell him a little bit about what you do now. Well. Uh, obviously, I'm a writer. I have uh, five books currently, or six, I believe it is, that are, are published. One of them is a two-time New York Times bestseller on bushcraft and survival. Um, I teach here in Ohio at the Pathfinder School that uh, we've had for the last 10 years, and also Pathfinder School Worldwide. We have uh, taught overseas fairly extensively over the last two years, um, everywhere from Scandinavia to Japan to Australia. Um, as well as oh, in the wow. U.S., we have once a month here. Um, we didn't travel as much this year because of the COVID issues. Um, otherwise, we would have had about nine overseas trips this year for teaching. Next year, we're looking at four to five already, depending on wow. the scenario, which means I'll be able to take my metal detector overseas quite a bit next year. Uh, I just got to find the right places to go. But uh, I'm going to Italy right. next year for sure. That should be that should be good. If I get into France, I'd love to get into some of those old World War II areas would be pretty awesome. Oh, yeah. Um, and, that would be wonderful. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, you know, in a nutshell, I mean, I, I, I teach survival all over the world in the U.S., and I write. I write for several magazines. I also write books. And really, I'm to the point in my life 
to be honest with you that I'm kind of in that semi-retired mode and you know, everybody's got to have a job and your job. Sometimes if your job is your hobby, then, then you're, it's a bonus. But when your job is right. your hobby for 10 years, then your hobby becomes more job than hobby again. And it's time to find new hobbies. And so uh, <laughs> anything that has to do with the outdoors or history, uh, cause I'm a big history buff too. I love history. Um, especially Revolutionary War history. Um, but those type things are kind of what attracted me to take up metal detecting again were the history portions of digging up something that, you know, had a past story or a past history behind it. It's just kind of a cool connection to the history, and it's something that I can do by myself if I want to. I don't have to have other people. It's not like I have to have students to teach because I can do it by myself. I can do it just about anywhere in Ohio. I mean, Ohio is really, really good as far as their laws and things like that with metal detecting. I mean, pretty much anywhere you go in a park, you can metal detect as long as you're not digging holes everywhere. Any beaches are open territory. It's pretty easy to get permissions here on land. And, of course, curb strips, things like that, are pretty much open season anywhere in Ohio. So it's right. it's pretty good for detecting here, and it, it's enjoyable for me. And I... I had a junkie detector when I was a kid. I messed with here and there, but you know, really, in the last few months, um, maybe five, six months, I've really gotten into it heavy again, and I feel like I'm learning pretty fast. One of the things that I've always had a talent for is picking things up pretty quick. So I'm picking up this metal detecting pretty fast, and I really enjoy it. Um, so yeah, I think doing things like this with you guys and hanging out with other metal detectors, you know, it's it's my turn. I guess, to be the student, per se. And I haven't had that for a long time, so I kind of like that. It's it's fun. Uh, I'm, you know, like I've been doing this for a, it's right at 22 years now, and I still learn uh, new things all the time. And uh, like you said, sometimes you just need a new hobby, although it's I'm delving into other things. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, within the same hobby, but uh, in other territories I've never uh, ventured out into. But um, it is fun to start a new hobby, and you have been really picking up fast. I've been watching some of your videos, and uh, I know Garrett had sent you the Apex uh, to try out, and uh, you did some testing with that. Now, did you dig the silver ring? With that, is that what um, I'm remembering, or was it ring. your pro? Um, the small silver ring, the wire silver ring, came out uh-huh. with the Apex. The larger, heavier okay. silver ring came out with the AT Pro. Okay, cool. So um, you've probably got more detecting hours on the AT Pro. Is is that correct? I'd say that's probably true. I think you always kind of fall back on what you have faith in. Which in, it's kind of yep. like fishing. You so always true. grab the first lure you think's going to catch a fish, and you've caught a million fish with it, so that's the one you always throw in the water first. It's, it's kind of the same exactly. way with me. I have a lot of confidence in AT Pro. I found a lot of stuff with it. So if I'm in an area and I'm, you know, you always get kind of unsure of yourself, and I'll swing the apex for a while, and the signals will be jumping a little bit. I have a prototype model anyway. I don't have a salt boat. It doesn't have all the updates, so it's a little bit jumpier probably than the new production models are. But sometimes, you know, I get frustrated. And I'll be like, I, I'm, I've got to be missing something. And all of a sudden, i got the AT Pro in my hand again. But I do have a lot right. of hours, for sure. Um, way more than 40 hours probably on the Apex now. Now, um, did you recently acquire an AT Max as well? I do. I, I did. I got an AT Max as well. And um, I haven't had as much time on it yet. Again, uh-huh. <laughs> I'm falling right. back. AT Pro. I get the AT Max out and it starts jumping around on me a little bit. Or the, the signals don't sound the same. The tones don't sound the same. Uh, the settings are a little different. I'm, I get frustrated. And I'm like, oh, man, I really want to find something. I know something's here. And then I end up going back to the AT Pro. Uh, but I'm trying to force myself. I, I've decided that I can't drive around with four detectors in my Jeep. That's the problem. Whenever I do that, <laughs> throw it in my hand before it's all over with. So I'm going to have to just yeah. start leaving every one detector 
and taking that out for the day and just dealing with it. Yeah. Um, it, anytime you switch from one detector to the next, there's always a big learning curve. Uh, and it, it honestly, uh, from switching from the AT Pro to the AT Max, it probably took me a full year to fully feel confident uh, with the AT Max. To me, there was a bigger learning curve on the AT Max than, of course, the AT Pro. Um, and for you, I mean, the Apex is still, you know, it's different enough from the AT Pro and the AT Max. So there's still a bit of a learning curve there as well. But, uh, um, yeah, yeah. that's part of the problem, just many stimuli at the same time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it I'm, just I'm, takes I'm, time, though. Switch, switch it up. Um, I don't know. But I do like the AT Pro a lot. There's no question that's definitely my favorite um, uh, of the four. Right, aspects. right. But I'm trying to push myself into the AT Max. And, and really, the only... I have to be honest with you. The only reason I really wanted the AT Max was because a it was wireless and b it was backlit. And since I was going to do stuff in the right. water, I wanted to. I wanted something that was. I didn't. I didn't realize when I when I again you know research pays off and I didn't do the proper research, but I didn't realize that with the AT Max being wireless, you still had to use wired headphones. If you're going to submerge everything, yeah, yeah, I was like, okay, well, I can go wireless. I won't have that cord hanging around, and I can just get in the water. But it's not that way, you right? Have to have it. And the blue headphones, or you know, the gray ghost, or something like that. So the only benefit right. to me is the backlight, and I found out very quickly that you can't even see <laughs> well underwater because it's not very. <laughs> Um, yeah, depending so, on where you're, what kind of visibility you have, etc. Um, right. So it's definitely. But there are well, actually some advantages to the Max than the Pro um, that, uh, especially in land hunting. Now, the Max is a much deeper uh, machine. Um, there's a few other things, uh, but... But like you said, the even though you can't use the wireless in the water, but it sure is handy on land when you're out in the woods and you're not getting hung on the, all the branches with the cords and, and right. all that. And so, I fully totally believe that that AT Max has merit, and I just need to force myself. I think what will happen is once it starts to get cooler and I can't get in the water anymore, you know, and I don't have to worry about, knowing how bulletproof my AT Pro is and I can drown the thing and never worry about it, then I'll be like, okay, let me get this AT Max out and, and let me start really learning that thing over the fall. Right, right. Um, so, Dave, I know that uh, Amanda probably has a few questions for you, too. Um, Amanda, do you have, have some things that you'd like to throw in here? Yeah, so congratulations on your thir uh, three firsts that you had that last hunt you posted the video on. Oh, cool. Thank I you. I you noticed that, huh? That's yeah, cool. that was pretty awesome. So you got the, what is it, general service button? Indian yeah, head? Yeah. <laughs> what, was, World War One what, was the, what was the Indian head date? It, it was 1907. 1907, that's so awesome. I was point, but it was my first Indian. And I saw the axe head. So knowing that you've done a lot of the survivalist stuff, do you think like when you find items like that, are you hoping that you're going to restore them? Sometimes. I mean, an axe head like that, to be honest with you, I mean, if there, there are guys that are, and I'm an axe junkie in a way. I mean, I've probably got 120 axes. I'm, I'll be honest with you. Yeah. I probably do have that many. Um, and I'm a member of the axe junkies Facebook group and everything. But I'm not so crazy about axes that I want to soak that thing in electrolysis for a week and try to restore it. Other than the fact I would like to see the rust removed to see if it's like Marked. if it's like a Black Raven axe or something like that, yep. that'd be worth some money. Um, you know, or a Kelly True Temper or something like that. But honestly, for me, on something like an axe head like that, unless it was an old tomahawk head that I was pretty suspicious that it was really early like revolutionary war it probably wouldn't trip my trigger any more than hey i found a cool accent yeah 
because well, I've got so many yeah. acts. For one would be like, yeah, especially something that's that crushed it up. There's a lot of work to to try to restore something like that, and you'd never get it back to having much value, even if it was a black raven, because yeah. the logo would be a blur. And it'd probably be pretty uh, painted, right. but it, it, some of them still come well, out good. I think so. what, I think that what I'm detecting is I like to like kind of put stories together. You know, like I look at, and in a, even if I'm just doing it in my own mind, it's not even true. It's just kind of cool. Like <laughs> if I look at things yeah. that I found when I was detecting the other day in that area, you know, I found a button from World War One. I. I found an Indian head penny that was in that time frame. And then I found that lead tank toy that was a World War I tank. So in my mind, I'm saying, you know, maybe some kid lived in this house and he had a brother who was actually in the service, an older brother or something, was actually in the service in World War I who left this button at the house somehow um, off a of uniform or whatever. And his little brother was playing with this tank toy out in the yard, thinking how cool it was to be like his big brother. You know what I mean? Yeah, putting, yeah, absolutely. Right. I mean, it's obviously fictional, fictional. I mean, you have, you know, it's fictional, but, but it's just kind of a cool thing to relate that to say, you know, how cool would that be to have been, you know, in that time frame? and you're, this little kid's got this World War One tank toy and somebody older than him has got this button on his uniform and somebody in that same time frame dropped that penny in the front yard. It, it's just, it, it kind of puts everything together in that area. Yeah. It tells, tells a cool story. You know whether it's made up or not. Uh, we've all we've all done that. Uh, it's funny. Uh, sometimes I create my own little <laughs> uh, ideas of stories. I'm sure Amanda does too, because you can't help but wonder how did that get there. And, exactly. You know uh, what? Right, and who held it last, and you know what it meant to that person. There's just so many different things, which makes this yeah. ho- you know hobby even more and more fun. But um, like um, Amanda was talking about, I mean, we all do have done electrolysis and stuff. I don't know if you know that uh, Amanda had told me about. Um, uh, there's some stuff called, um, oh, now the name rust. is gone, a vapor rust. Have you ever exactly. tried using that? Somebody yeah. told me about that just a couple of days ago. No, I haven't tried it. But a guy, Ryan Bishop, who is an old student of mine, who's a big metal detecting guy, as soon as he saw that uh-huh. thing, he's like, well, I'm expecting to see you putting a vapor rust on that thing and rehanging that axe. And I was like, oh, man. Go <laughs> 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 right. do that. Um, right. Yeah. So, heard about that stuff myself the other day. Uh, yep. Another thing is C- CLR. We both use CLR a lot to uh, clean some of those old rusty relics as well. Okay. What were you going to say, Amanda? Uh, I was going to say that vapor rust stuff is amazing. And if there's still paint on different items, it will actually, like, won't do any damage. It's biodegradable. And I, I've i actually found that I'm using it a lot more than the CLR now, Gypsy. Um, the CLR has that smell that, like, I immediately yes. get a headache. Yeah. So I just feel more comfortable that this is stuff I can dump, like, in the plants out front and it doesn't kill them <laughs> right so right. exactly and the fact that it can it it does it gets that rust off and the original paint can still be like underneath and okay and so it, it really is it i think it depends on the amount of rust on it i know i've soaked stuff you know for 24 hours 48 hours taking it out and just giving it a scrub and the rust comes right off other items that oh. have, you know, like the two to three inch, the big crust um, sections of it have taken a little bit longer. Um, but it's a sit. It's yeah, more like a. To try to restore that now. Yeah, it's a. You know it's a sit and set, so you really don't have to do anything. And again, uh, if that evapo rust, I'm not worried about it ruining the item. So I, I, you know, I don't have a problem if, say, I get pulled away or I forget about it for 24 hours. Um, I know it's not going to do damage to it. So, yeah, the CLR, you really have to keep an eye on it uh, because it can ruin items. Um, I uh, actually, though, I found a ring 
this last week, and it had at first I thought it was just a plain junk green, which it wasn't precious metal, but it but it is like a carbon type uh, black carbon, but it had like this stuff on it. And then I just threw it in the uh, CLR for just not even barely a minute. And then that calcite just popped right off it. It accumulated on it from the river. And it just came, it just came right off. So, um, yeah, you really have to keep an eye on that uh, CLR sometimes because it can ruin an item if you're not careful. Okay. Well, I'm going to try to find that evapor rush. You get that on Amazon or something? Um, actually, I got it at uh, like the VIP Auto Place. Like, so any automotive okay. stores tend to have it, and it's a big like gray, gray gallon, and it's I think it was like fourteen ninety nine for a gallon. That's no big deal. Okay, so let's talk. About, I'm going to tell you something real quick about your bead that you lost in your sink. Yeah. <laughs> I want to tell you something real quick, okay? Yeah. You probably could get that bead in five minutes. Oh, yeah? Yeah, because when you look under your sink, there's a section called the P-trap. Do you know what that is? I do. Okay, well, everything heavy, it's like, that thing's just like a sluice box. Everything heavy falls into that P-trap, and it's very hard to flush it through that P-trap, especially if there's any hair or anything that that bead could get clogged into it's probably in that P-trap. And if you just pulled that P-trap out and washed it out, not only would you probably clean any gunk that was clogging your sink up or slowing it down now, you'd probably get that bead out too. Yeah, I contemplated it. And then I was like, you know, I don't know the last time that trap has been cleaned. <laughs> and all I could picture That's is the job. gag reflex not really being so great <laughs> with the- <laughs> well, because That's I- why you get John to do that. No. You get John to do that. I did like I stuck I stuck my finger like next to the um the plug like down in and like when I pulled it out the like black came with it and I was like oh that's so gross. So I did I did one of those is it worth it? <laughs> uh, yeah, the yeah. I probably should. Uh, tell them, you know, I, then maybe I should just drop something more valuable down the sink. And then, oh, look, I forgot. I lost the oh, bead, too. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, I tend to have that gag reflex, too, when it comes to the clogged hair in the sink. But we, we're, anyway, <laughs> we've gone somewhere else. <laughs> well, no. So, <laughs> be- before I figured out that I probably should be washing a lot of this stuff outside, the, especially the stuff that's coming out of the, the dumps and the mud and the ocean, like mud grossness. Um, I was washing them in the bathroom sink. So I've seen the the stuff that's come off a lot of these items go down the sink. <laughs> so that's where I was like, no, <laughs> no, I don't. Uh... <laughs> oh, goodness. Um Tell tell um, Dave about all those buckle things you found. I think I he saw missed a that. Did you see the photo? Oh man, it was That's epic! Crazy. <laughs> I've never seen it. Ah, uh, crazy! I'm not sure still how many. I know that I have 110 um, that I wow. dug. Um, I'd given a, uh, you know, a couple handfuls to, to my digging partner that was with me. So, um, but mm-hmm. I don't think she's cleaned them up or, or whatnot. So I'm, I'm not actually sure how many we unearthed, um, on that dig. So are those, but, all, are those all copper? I mean, uh, brass? They are. Yep. Okay. Yep. And I was thinking perhaps it was like a brass pile because I found, um, a Gillette razor handle and the brass gas like valve pipe stems that have like the decorative designs on them like early gas um you know those brass piping that they'd used to have in the house yeah um a couple pieces Uh of that and um that pin and a couple brass buttons or that one brass button and i forget there was a couple other brass items in there so then i was like well perhaps they separated you know, the trash out and they put the brass in one section and, 
Yeah, I. It's again one of those things. I, I think someone wrote, uh, you know, on my post that uh, rest in peace, all the little leprechauns, you know, because they were all relatively small buckles. <laughs> and I was like, that's horrible. Um, but yeah, making up stories of how in the world did you know over a hundred buckles uh, become Insane. all together and tossed? Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. crazy. Yeah. But you get so, Mike, Mike just joined us, Mike here. Nice. Um, I think so, he did. And- Dave, when you're out in the wilderness and doing these survival, um, teaching the survival stuff, have you come across like old foundations or a lot of abandoned oh, yeah. places? Oh yeah, for sure. And believe me, I'm I'm kicking myself now for not remembering where half of them are. <laughs> no. Yeah, there's actually my property backs up to a, a six uh, four thousand acre wildlife area so it's about six miles square but um and there's another wildlife inside that that's actually by an old iron forest and so there were a lot of old buildings in this area like in the 17th in the 17 i'm sorry the 1865 maps the atlas of this area i have a pdf file of the 1865 atlas for this area there's a lot of houses on that that are not here anymore obviously but there's quite a few of those buildings and things that want out in this wildlife area and i've tried to find a couple of them and i can't find any sign of them but when i've been out there teaching course and stuff because we use that wildlife area a lot because it butts up to my property to teach courses me and my instructors have found old foundations hey look there used to be a house right there and then now we can't find them huh well, if you need help finding them, <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> oh boy. Um, well, it's there. I mean, I, I guess the old. Yeah, this is a really old area here. Um, I, I live. I hate giving my exact location away to where I live, but I mean, I live near an iron furnace that was a full production iron furnace during the Civil War, all the way up until the early. Oh 1900s. wow. Um, and it's a big iron furnace and I live probably within 10, 15 miles of four of those. Oh, and this wow. area, Jack, wow. famous for iron. Um, that's what this area is famous for salt and iron. And so it's a huge oh, okay. area, not only revolutionary war and civil war, but it's also a huge area, industrial revolution type area, area too. So there's a lot oh. to be had. It's just a matter of finding the right place and the right permissions. Um, there's actually, right. I know, right down the street from my house on the eighteen on the 1865 map, there was a school that's not there anymore. Um, and it's on the guy's property next to me who owns the property next to mine. And he's already told me, you know, as soon as fall comes and the foliage goes down in there, I'm welcome to look for that school. But there was a schoolhouse and other oh, building right beside that aren't there anymore that are less than a quarter of a mile from my house. I mean, I can walk to them. So there's a lot oh, of stuff wow. really close around here. Um, and I'm traveling two hours, two and a half, three hours last weekend. But there's really a lot of stuff around here I haven't even begun to touch yet. Right. You've got a whole, that whole area that sounds like uh, a big, one big playground. <laughs> so, um, yeah, um, that school, schools, old schools and even modern schools have always been a very productive. Um, so you should find some good, some goodies there, especially if it's never been hunted. So I doubt that place has ever been hunted to be honest with you. I doubt it very seriously. Awesome. Um, I mean, there's some people in Jackson that hunt, but not to that extent. I mean, most of the guys I've met in Jackson, hunt the beaches and things like that and the parks, they're not, hardcore field diggers that are looking for old, you know, stuff that ain't there anymore. They're looking for stuff that's still there. Um, but right. I need those guys that, that go a little deeper than that. Um, a, a buddy of mine, tech with off and on, he goes pretty deep after old foundations and old houses and things like that. And this, this place is just crazy, Jesse. I mean, I can tell you stories that this place is nuts. I mean, there's, there's a, a lot of stuff here to be found, but I kind of, I've, fall back into my survival mentality sometimes you know when you when you make a camp in the woods you always collect your firewood and your water 
further away from your camp than it is. So that if you really need it, it's always next to your camp. And I'm kind of like that with this, with this melody tech. I'm like, you know, one of these days I'm not going to place the melody tech and I got a cabin on my property. I can go get that anytime I want to. Right. Right. It's, so, al- so it's, it's always good too to keep that one in your back pocket. So if you run out of right. a- other areas or say they're harvesting or planting or it's a drought or whatever, um, dig- having your own property to dig is, is pretty good to have. Yeah, I think so. I think so. So a lot of these properties that are really close, I haven't really hit them yet just because they're there. I know they're there. I know where they're at. Right, right. I have hit some that are close. I mean, within a few miles for sure. And a few beaches and parks, things within a few miles. But, but I've been traveling further and further away. This stuff just because, um, I can't, you know what I mean? And I don't have to hunt. these Right. Areas. Right. So for the um, for the areas have, in Ohio, have you uh, used any of the Sanborn maps or LIDAR, Dave, to, like, find I other locations? Not. Okay. I haven't. I, I, you know, I really have slacked on the research end of this thing in a lot of ways because I'm in the middle of writing another book right now. Oh. Um, and deadline is in November. So I've kind of slacked a little bit on some of the research that I've wanted to do and some of the things I've wanted to learn about how to find some of this stuff. And I've, I've been told about the Sanborn maps. I've never really played with them too much. I found this, uh, I found this 1875 uh, Almanac or Atlas online for Jackson County. And it has every, every house, every street, and every township that was in Jackson County at that time is on these maps. It's like an atlas that was issued you know, people could get it for free and it's still online. So I've got that and that has a lot of stuff on it, but okay. it really doesn't have the civil, it's the civil war stuff. I mean, it was actually a civil war training camp, 12 miles from there. Oh. In, oh. in, uh, in uh, town, cut. it's now called Oak Hill. It wasn't called Oak Hill back then. It had another name. I can't remember what it was, but it's called Oak Hill now. And it was actually a civil war training camp there. And if I could find out whose property that was on and figure right. that out, that would probably be huge. That would be, ooh. yeah, someone just said in the chat, you hit the gold mine. <laughs> um, yeah, if you can find those old fort sites, unfortunately, I mean, or old camp sites, uh, Civil War and stuff, um, those are those are very hard to find. Uh the ones that haven't been detected over and over and over again, right. especially uh, like Virginia and here in Texas where I live. Um, I'm going not this coming weekend, but the following weekend I'm going up to, uh, we have a family reunion at Fort Belknap um, every year and a lot of the property around the fort has just been hit over and over and over, but I've got family that lives on some of that property and on some of that property. So I get to go do that every year and occasionally you'll pop something, but a lot of it just, there's just been hit so much. So if you could find a virgin site like that and find the property owner and, you know, obtain permission, Oh, you should go for that all the way. Yeah. Well, I got to figure out where it was exactly first, but I, right. Right. A lot of stuff um, that's out there that kind of shows where it was. You just kind of have to compare that to the roads that are there now to figure it out. You, you know more about that than I do, but um, I'm sure it could be figured out fairly easily with some concentrated effort. Yeah. Um, sure. By the way, Mike Hare said if you ever need any help, because he's got a lot of the old Ohio um, Sanborn maps and stuff, and he okay. knows how to do the overlaying. So if you need help finding some, looking for some sites, uh, he said he would be happy to help you. Um, oh, that's awesome. So, yeah. Actually, that's Dennis. Yeah, just let him know. Uh, yeah, uh, Dennis. That was uh, Dennis. Just uh, commented in the chat. Um, he's who I thought was Mike earlier. 
uh, posted his all my metal mode because he's one of the uh, podcaster uh, hosts as well. Uh, he says he wants to come up to Fort Belknap with me, <laughs> but he's the guy I was telling the, telling you about earlier that um, um, might be able to come to Ohio and uh, hunt with Mike and I and you all. Whatever, yeah, that'd be awesome. So. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Um, he is full of so much knowledge. It's uh, just blows my mind. <laughs> just talking to him, I just eat it up every time I'm detecting with him and, and learn so much from, from Dennis. Uh, so um, I, I just uh, love going digging with him. And he just, um, Dennis, was it yesterday? I picked up my metal detector. I don't even remember anymore. But uh, he just gave me some copies on a flash drive of some Texas Sanborn maps. So I'm really excited to dig into that. Very oh, that's cool. <laughs> so, yeah, that's um, awesome. But um, let's see. Um, did you have something? Yeah. So um, I also, Amanda, I see that you do like diving as well. Um, so yeah, are, yeah. are you going to be incorporating? Well, depending on when, you know, with your book and, and the deadline and stuff. But are, what, are you incorporating detecting with your diving? Actually, I am. Um, yeah. I was trying to figure out a way to, you know, I've been a scuba diver since I was 15. I've done a lot. Of, I did Shark Week in 2012. I've done a lot of diving. But, and I see guys on the online diving, actual scuba diving to find stuff in inland waters and that's cool there's nothing wrong with that but i think as far as the rivers go and as far as like the beaches and things go i think that i've got this theory in my mind and again theories are only as good as they pan out to be but i've got these theories in my mind i've watched guys metal detecting beaches here in ohio and i've and they can never they never go out any deeper than about chest level which is about mm-hmm. three quarters of the way to the marker buoys and then they're like done because they've got the detector already underwater, they're up in chest high water, and they've they're, they've got that big long pole with the scoop on it. They're shoving it underneath the sand to try to get what's what's under there without pinpointing anything. Just find it with the detector and scooping it up. And I think that if you could get out there with an, a device like that Blue Three, where you could actually put on a weight belt that would hold you to the bottom, and you're only in you know eight nine feet of water at the most. Most of the time, probably six feet of water is enough. You're going to get out there right at the edge of those marker buoys where everybody floats around on the rafts and stuff, messing around, drinking beer and losing their stuff (laughs) that nobody's ever found because nobody's been out that far. They're, they're finding the stuff that people are walking around losing, but they're not finding the stuff people are floating around losing. And I think that, I think there is a way to, I mean, you can obviously go to a river and just rent a canoe for a day from a canoe livery and throw your metal detector in there and once you pay the fee, you've got the canoe for the day. So there's a million places around here that rent canoes where I could just go chase rivers all day, figure out where everybody's swimming, and swing a detector in there. And I could take the scuba unit, the, the Blue 3 there too as well, the hookah unit. But I think that the beaches are probably a prime target where the water's not moving at all. It's fairly clear. You can get out there early in the morning when nobody's there. And I, I honestly, Iris and I tomorrow are leaving. We're going to, there's a, a beach not real far from here, about 40 minutes from here. That's a big beach, and it's a very popular beach. And it's been used all summer long. And Iris and I went and scouted it last weekend, and there was a lot of people there. And so tomorrow afternoon we're leaving, and we're going to go camp there for the night. And I'm going to shallow water detect it in the evening, and maybe do a little bit of evening detecting along the beach and in the shallow water. And then the next morning I'm going to get up, and I'm going to throw that blue three in the water, and I'm going to get out by the marker buoys, with a with a handheld detector under the water and see if I can find some more stuff. You definitely will. Um, that is so so true. Um, you know, I've been beach detecting and surf hunting and river hunting and and lake hunting and you name it. And you know, I mainly go out to you know my chest. Uh, you know, or with if it's at the beach, you know with the long handle stick maybe up to my neck, but I'm short. So <laughs> I, uh, right. 
I'm not able to get out as, out there as far as even some of the taller guys metal detecting. They would, it always aggravated me. I'd go hunt at a a swimming area with someone, and they would be way taller, so they'd be able to get out there further and end up finding more wings. And um, with with the uh, Blue Three, uh, the Nemo, um, I'm anxious to see uh, what you find and what you do because uh, I've been thinking of purchasing one myself. Uh, because we now sell them um, through Digger's Den. So if any of you uh, listeners are interested in purchasing one, uh, you can go to our Digger Den uh, website, uh, ddetectors.com, and use my code GYPSY, all caps, um, um, to get a little discount there. Um, but um, we are now selling those, and so... Um, I've been dying to try one out. So um, I am definitely going to uh, get one very soon, I'm hoping, before the summer's. <laughs> but I've got so many irons in the fire right now. Uh, That's the way I am. So I'm anxious to see. Yeah, I'm anxious to see what you find and uh, check out your videos and uh, what you end up with because um, I've been seeing your post on the, the Blue 3 so really excited to uh, well, see what. I'm pretty confident it's going to be exactly what I need. It's just a matter of putting all the other pieces together. You know, I'm figuring out how I'm going to work the detectors at the same time, that close to the bottom and things like that. Um, how small I can collapse them. I actually have, I actually have some other another detector that's made for water. That's a, a lot smaller. Um, and I may end up having to go to that before it's over with. We'll see. I don't know. It's not going to give me anything except, hey, there's metal in the ground. The metal is dirt. But it's not going to give me any numbers or PDIs or anything like that, or any tones for that matter. It's just going to vibrate. But so I can Yeah, those bottom. little pulse, yeah, um, those little pulse dive uh, type. Um, I've used some of good. those before. Um, but you can pretty much break down your. Uh, 18 Pro and 18 Max to where you can get it super small for up to, you know, 10 feet worth of diving, which is about all you'll need. Um, there is a way that you can take, um, you know, that rod. I, well, I know that Aqua Trigger, he's shortened, he's kind of made, made a makeshift diving AT Max or AT Pro, I can't remember which one, but there's many different ways you can modify that too to even shorten it to where it just makes it super small. So um, that might be something you want to do. But yeah, I kind of, when I'm underwater, I kind of miss not being able to have my target ID because some of those areas I get, you know, a lot of iron and a lot of trash. So it's good to have a little bit of that either discrimination or something um, other than, you know, those type of pulse type machines. Right. Well, for me, I mean, I'd rather know if it's a 60s target or 80s target so I know I'd get excited or not. That's the bat, you know. Right. <laughs> That's for sure. That's for <laughs> yeah. sure. But anyway, it, I don't know. We'll see. I'm going to try a couple different things tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to be my or this next couple of days is going to be my experimental stage with with some of the stuff I'm going to try to shorten up the AT pro as short as I can get it. And I had thought about modifying it, um, actually, but I just can't bring myself to do it, um, to make it much shorter, but I'm going to see how it works tomorrow and, and what I come up with in the next two days. And if I come up with a lot of rings or, or a lot of stuff, then it might be worth, like you said, it might be worth taking one of those machines and breaking it down further and making it a, a whole lot smaller where I can get the VDI numbers and things like that off of it. So we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Um, I may be doing that soon to one of mine, especially when I get the uh, the Blue 3, the Nemo, um, and just make one special and use it only for diving. Uh, right. But yeah, you can break those down pretty small. So um, switching subjects again because we're running close, running out of time here. Amanda, did you have anything? 
Yeah. So um, how can everyone find you on social media if they say want to give you a follow? I know we put the link in for your YouTube, but are you on Facebook yeah. and all that? Oh, yeah. Stuff? They can, love it. Yeah, they can track me on Facebook just by typing my name in Dave Canterbury. I've got a fan page and a personal page. Um, I actually have two fan pages because one of them got hijacked for a while and it took me forever oh, to get no. it back. Um, yeah, that was, that was a mess, but luckily I know some people on Facebook, so I got to take care of pretty quick, but so I actually have two fan pages, but one of them has a lot more activity on it than the other one. So they'll know the difference when they see it. Um, and then I have a YouTube channel with Outfitters. My Instagram is Pathfinder survival and my Twitter is Pathfinder survival too. I believe I don't post on Twitter very much. Usually it's mostly Instagram and Facebook and YouTube. Um, but so those are all easy to find them. My website is com where we sell everything, including pretty soon, Garrett Metal Detectors. We've worked a deal with Garrett right. to, uh, we've worked with Garrett a little bit to get some stuff together for them, and we're going to start selling, and we'll sell Blue 3 as well, I think, before it's over with. Awesome. Uh, That's exciting. Yeah. So we're kind of working with that kind of stuff, too. I'm kind of opening up the genre a little bit of what we sell to kind of capture. I mean, we've always sold fishing and trapping and hunting and outdoor stuff. So, you know, the more outdoor activities I can encompass into, you know, my store, my online presence, the, the better off I am. Um, we should talk yeah, about the Ohio. But, so too. Yeah, I wanted to talk about that. But before we do, um, let's, uh, we had one question from Dennis. Um, he was asking, um, is the, Okay, is the breathing with the Blue 3 comparable to a dive regulator? It is and it's not. It is very much as far as the flow. The only difference is what happens with it is because you have a pump, it's an on-demand pump that operates the Blue 3. So basically it's drawing an oxygen from above. The dive flag tube is actually an oxygen inlet tube. So when you breathe in on the mouthpiece it on demand turns the pump on and pumps air down the tube to free to breathe it in so when you breathe in you kind of get a little bit of a vibration in the tube i mean you can feel a vibration in your mouth a little bit from air being forced down the tube but other than that i mean it is very very normal very relaxing once you if you only dove before if all you've ever done is scuba you'll, you'll probably be like this thing is freaking noisy and it, and it probably is, but you get used to it pretty quick. You're, I mean, you're not worried about looking at fish. So if you scare the fish away, who cares? Um, you're trying to find metal. But at the same time, if you've never done scuba before, you're probably going to think it's the greatest thing to slice bread right off the bat. Awesome. Well, thanks for that information. Um, I hope that helped, Dennis. Um, maybe uh, when we um, meet uh, in Ohio... Um, I can pick your brain some more about that blue three before I go ahead and bite the bullet on that. But we'll take that. You know um, what we'll do? I'll, I'll call blue three and I'll have them send me a couple mouthpieces and we'll take that thing to the lake. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. Um, you know what I mean? I'm excited. Uh, I'm excited. So um, Dave is going to be um, doing a. Um, well, let me just hand that over to you, Dave. Uh, tell them about the camp, uh, the thing happening okay. in Ohio, and then we'll go from there. Well, what we're trying to do is we're setting up an event that is that basically will let people be introduced to metal detecting. If you know someone, if it's a child or if it's an adult, either one that's that's never detected before and they're interested in learning and they don't want to spend the money right off the bat to get into it, or they don't know what machine to buy, they don't know anything about it, whatever the case may be. Um, they can come to this event. It's $50 for the whole day per person. Garrett is supplying the machines, and we're going to make sure that everything else is supplied for them, shovels, pinpointers, all that stuff. We'll have all that stuff there for them. We're going to have experts like yourself are going to be there and some other metal detecting guys that have lots and lots of years of experience, way more than me, are going to be there. Um, and we're going to just – the $50 really is a donation that we're donating to the BSA camp. It's a Boy Scouts of America camp. It's over 600 acres. It's had thousands and thousands of Boy Scouts through there in the last 60 years. And it is absolutely riddled with clad and scout memorabilia. So 
it's a place that I know people can go with the new machine that I've never detected before because I did it myself. The very first time I went with the new machine, a buddy of mine took me out to this place and I found about $20 in change in about four hours. So wow. there's, there's, it's, there was, he, he started calling me dime Dave because there was one spot that we were in <laughs> that I wasn't taking two steps and I was digging a dime, two steps, digging a dime, two steps, digging a dime. I kept getting 81, 82, 81, 82. And I dug about three hours in dimes and about an hour out of this place within probably 25 foot circle. That's so the place insane. is just crazy. <laughs> it's insane with targets. So it's not a, the, the cool thing about this is, is that, you know, we don't have to seed this thing. We don't have to, we don't have to buy a bunch of foreign coins, throw them out there for kids to find. This stuff's actually in the ground and they're going to find it and it's going to be old and crusty and nasty. And there's been some good stuff found out there. I mean, there's been a Buffalo nickel found out there. There's been a war nickel found out there. There's been a silver quarter found out there. There's been scout memorabilia found out there. There's been a couple of pins, a couple of slides. I found three slides myself out there, scarf slides, uh, two cubs and a scout cool. slide. So there's plenty of stuff out there in the ground. I found a cross out there. So there's plenty of stuff to be found out there. And I think that whoever comes out there, whether it's a kid or an adult, if they get excited about digging stuff out of the dirt, they're going to have an absolute blast for eight solid hours. And we're going to feed them. We're going to have drinks and food, you know, sack lunches for everybody, a snack for everybody. And we're going to have drinks for everybody all day. Um, we're talking about you're going to donate some stuff. We're going to donate some stuff. Garrett's probably going to donate some swag. And we're going to have some prize giveaways um, during the day and things like that. And they're going to get to hang out with cool people like you, right? Yeah. So I'm I'm so excited about uh, doing this. And it's always, uh, to me, it's always wonderful to be able to give back to the kids. And I know we've opened it up to adults, too, that want to try it out as well. Um so um, I'm I'm super excited about this. Um, I think it's a great opportunity. So if any of you know of anyone in the Ohio area that uh, might be interested in this, Dave, how can they find out more information about this event? The event's been posted on several different groups. So if you go to the events tab on most of the metal detecting groups, they'll find it. If they go to the events tab on my page, on my fan page they'll find it if they go to the pathfinder school on facebook the pathfinder school on facebook and type in events and go to the events tab they'll find it um we could also so link to it anywhere you want to jeff see that you can steer people to um it's a very simple process they're just going to pay pal iris the money we're going to write a check to the boy scout camp at the end of the event um again you know, 50 bucks for a day of, of having a blast it's pretty cheap fun in my opinion yeah it really is, and uh, Garrett's supplying the detectors and the yep. uh, stuff that they're going to need, so uh, it's great for people that uh, want to give it a try and have some fun, and uh, great prizes as well, and great company, so um, it's a win-win situation. So um, you can also go to All Metal, I mean All Metal Mode, um, well, we'll post it on All Metal Mode, um, Facebook as well. Um, there, Dave has also posted the event on uh, my Zero Discrimination Facebook yep. uh, group. So be sure and go there, and you can find it as well. We'll be reposting that uh, too. Uh, so y'all go ahead and um, be sure and check that out as well. And yeah, I mean, the place is crazy. I can't even tell you how awesome it was for me, you know, with the new machine to walk out there, just like bang, 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 bang. And there's targets everywhere. When I did the apex video out there, I bet I didn't walk 20 feet to shoot that entire video. That's, that's insane. Uh, it, it sounds like it's going to be, be awesome. Uh, awesome opportunity, uh, for these people to come back. So, um, really excited about that. So y'all be sure and go check out that event. Uh, if you can't find it, you can contact me uh, through Facebook or Instagram or, you know, one of those, my YouTube. You can find my email, um, and I can get that information over to you as well. And uh, be sure and share share the information uh, if you can. Uh, we love it when you share the information uh, so we can get the word out um, 
to the masses. So uh, appreciate all your help. And uh, we want to thank you all for listening. Go ahead. I couldn't uh, hear I, you. I forgot to say that. I'm sorry. There's a, a limit of 40 people to this thing. So it's kind of a first come, first serve type of deal. Yes. Um, because of COVID and the way we're going to have to divide things up, um, there, there is a limit of 40 people, and I think you've already got 10 plus already signed up. So if you're yeah. wanting to attend this event, uh, I would do it fast, uh, sign up fast. So. Anything else we leave out that we need to I don't think cover? So. Not anyway. Okay. Well, thank you all for listening tonight. Um, Amanda, you got something you wanted to, anything you wanted to say or close with? Yeah. Nope, I'm good. I hope everyone has a good evening and uh, finds whatever treasures they're looking for. Definitely. Well, wishing you all a wonderful evening and um, happy hunting and uh, good luck to you. Thank you, Dave, for being with oh, us tonight. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Good night, all. Good night.